Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Locke. Welcome to another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today we're having a look at a very cheap entry level light. So this is the Wheelight Ninja 20. It's a 200 watt Bowen mount light, a daylight COB. It boasts very good color render scores and DMX control. Now it sells for a crazy 300 US dollars. All right, so let's go over how much it costs and what you get for your money. All right, so it sells for 300 US dollars, about 400 Australian dollars. So you get a cardboard box for that with a foam insert. So you do not get a bag. I think you're, you're expecting a bit much if you want a bag for 300 bucks. All right, so you get the light, of course. Now the light is surprisingly well built for the price point. The top's aluminium, the bottom's aluminium, the sides are um, feel like an industrial plastic. Um, the front of the CAB, it's covered with a glass, so you know it's got a protector. The one sort of negative looking at the front is the CAB is not perfectly in the center, so that messes with me a little bit uh, with my OCD. The stirrup is actually well constructed, it's, it's an alloy, and the receiver here is alloy as well. So that's usually the weak point on cheap lights. The reason I don't review a lot of them is the stirrups are usually rubbish. Um, the locking handle here is plastic, but it doesn't feel like it's gonna break anytime soon. Now, it does have very good locking on it. You lock it in place, it is not going to move. Okay, so you could put a reasonably uh, big dish on this, or big dish, or a big soft box, something like a, a three foot dome. It's not gonna collapse on you. Now, the next thing you get is a power supply. This thing is huge and heavy. So that's probably a negative, but for the price, um, you know, it's amazing that you're getting this whole thing. I mean, the power supply would probably cost you 50 bucks. Now, in terms of negatives with the power supply, the, um, it sends out 36 volts DC. So the light runs off 36 volts. So if you're looking to run off a V-mount battery, that isn't gonna happen. All right, the last thing you get in the kit is a bow and mount dish. Now, this bow and mount dish has a tremendous hotspot. So um, if you're looking at this thing online and reading the stats, it sounds massively impressive in terms of the light output. That's because of the insane hotspot in the center of the dish. All right, so let's go through the pros and cons. And the first pro is really a surprise for me, and that is the quality of the light coming out of it. It's got a good CCT. It's got a good Delta UV or white point. It's got good color render. So just to give you an overview, uh, the lowest color render score I've recorded is 93 and the highest is 94, so that's the TN30 color vector scores. And the SSI is 74, so um, not bad at all, particularly for the price, or not even for the price. That's a respectable score um, on a lot of daylight COB lights, so yeah, I'm very surprised at that. Um, the next plus is the user interface. So you've got a nice big um, LCD screen, and you can clearly see what you're doing. Now, the unit dims in 1% increments, by the way, so, uh, all the way down to zero. And it retains a pretty good uh, uh, quality of light all the way through the dimming. Now, clearly on the display, you can see things like your remote control settings. I don't have the remote control with me. And you can see things like your, your DMX address, very, very straightforward. Now, in terms of running this thing off DMX, uh, the DMX ports uh, on the bottom of them, they're the RJ45s, I think it's called. So they're the, uh, you know, what looks like a, a phone connector. So uh, to run off your DMX, just plug your DMX into the bottom. And to switch the light over to DMX mode, you hold down the set button for five seconds. So you've got to count to five. And then when you release the button, it'll be in the DMX mode. Now the DMX mode, it's not the greatest DMX mode. It's a single channel profile. It's pretty good for like setting your levels, but there is a delay of about say half a second and it's very steppy if you're doing uh, slow automated fades, but that is definitely a pro if you're a professional user. And the next thing that is an unexpected pro for me is I tried using this with different optical and optical mounts. None of them fitted except the Forza 500 Fresnel. Now the stirrup and lock-offs on this light can easily take the weight of this heavy modifier. And much to my surprise, it's a very even and consistent beam. The barn door cuts are superb, especially when you consider that this Fresnel was not made for this light. And the other thing that surprised me, 
is with the COB not being perfectly in the center, I could still get good flood spotting. So with this combination, you could have a very good daylight Fresnel for under 500 US dollars. Now, because I think that is such a quality combination, it's such an unbeatable price, uh, I've also taken down all of the reading measurements for that. So that'll be in the technical part of the video as well. All right, let's get into the cons. Now, the first con is only a con because this light has DMX. All right, so just uh, play along with me here for the scenario. So imagine we've got this up in a studio lighting grid. We've got it programmed into our DMX. We've got great control over everything. All right, let's uh, finish our pre-light. We'll come back in the morning, turn the power off, come back the following day, plug the power back in, and the light does not fire up because it's a software-driven on-off switch, okay? To turn the light back on, you have to hold the button down, all right? So that's a real big negative in terms of the DMX being used in a studio situation. The next possible negative is the hotspot on the dish. It is quite pronounced, but Look, in all seriousness, you can buy a dish online really cheap. The next negative is the power input. It's 36 volts, so you can't run it directly from a battery. And the last negative is the cooling system. So it doesn't have the best bearings in the fan. Now it runs pretty quiet, but it's one of those lights where if you tilt it, you might get the bearings on, on a bit of an angle, and you might have to give it a bit of a slap to, to bed them and get it running quiet. So I have to do that probably one in 10 tilts, give it a little bit of a tap to quiet down the cooling fan. Now, here's the thing with the fans. I don't think the fan uh, by itself is that much of a concern in terms of noise. I mean, I'm standing right next to it wearing a microphone. Maybe you haven't heard it, but it's borderline. If I had two or three of these in a room, I'd keep a nervous eye on the sound recordist. But here's the thing that really concerns me or something you need to be aware of with the cooling system. All right, so the fan sucks cold air in through the bottom and blows it out through the top, but it also blows air out of these vents here around the COB. Now, if you've got a softbox modifier on or a Fresnel, that's gonna muffle it. But if you're using a dish, it's gonna act like a megaphone and increase the noise level. So with a dish on, the noisiest place to stand around this light is directly in front of it. Now you do have a button to turn the fan off, but it reduces your output to 20%. Now let's see how this light responds to DMX cues. I have the light receiving DMX commands via a Lumen Radio receiver. Regardless of if you have a Lumen Radio or a hardwired connection, the response times are the same. To give you something to compare it to, I have a Titan tube that is also running off CRMX. Both lights will be receiving identical commands at the same time. We will start with instant on-off commands. Now let's have a look at five second automated fades. Now let's have a look at two and a half second automated fades. Now let's look at one second automated fades. And finally, half second automated fades. Let's take a look at the data I've collected, starting with AC power draw. The maximum power draw recorded over two and a half days was 235.8 watt. These are the brightness results, and the meter was set to 400 ISO with a 50th of a second shutter at 25 frames per second. Now to give you a clear indication of the light level with the reflector, I've taken readings inside and outside of the hotspot. These are the brightness readings with the Forza Fresnel in both flood and in spot 
taken at a distance of 3 metres. Also down the bottom is the spectrometer results. 5,924 Kelvin with a TN30 color vector score of 94 and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0006 which means the light is ever so close to the Planckian curve. Here are the spectrometer results with the light with its dish attached at different brightness levels. Here are the spectrometer results with the light at different brightness levels with no modifier attached. Now let's take a closer look at these results. At 100% brightness with no modifier, I got 5,799 Kelvin with an SSI of 74. The TN30 color vector results were 94% average color accuracy with an average 102% saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 was below 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of zero, which places it right on top of the Planckian curve and about a 1 8th correction gel towards magenta from the daylight curve. At 50% brightness, I got 5,854 Kelvin with an SSI of 72. The TN30 color vector results were 93% average color accuracy with a 102% average saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 was below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0008, which makes the light very accurate to the Planckian curve, but magenta from the daylight curve to roughly the equivalent of a 1 8th correction gel. At 10% brightness, I got 5,964 Kelvin with an SSI of 70. The TN30 color vector results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, R9 and R12 were below 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0024, which would put the light off the Planckian curve to the equivalent of a 1 8th correction gel towards magenta and off the daylight curve by the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel towards magenta. All right, so that's another gear review done and I just wanna leave you with some closing thoughts. I've been doing this job now for 23 years. 23 years I've been a gaffer and I can remember buying a 200 watt HMI. It cost me 6,300 Australian dollars. Now, it wasn't as bright as this. You couldn't hot restrike it. Um, the ballast uh, cooling fan was noisy, the globe buzzed, so it was actually louder than this. You couldn't dim it, and you couldn't have DMX on it. So it's amazing how far the technology's come in 20 years, how affordable filmmaking has become. All right, take care everyone, see you on set.